my name is Makeda Mahadio and this is a CNBC Africa special panel. At the Kigali Audiovisual Forum, a plethora of topics around the subject were discussed, giving the local film industry practical tools for the growth that the Rwandan government is looking to nurture. This year, during the second edition of the two-day event, I moderated a panel discussion on getting film and TV content funded. Joining me on that panel was René Denis, the audiovisual attaché for East Africa at the French Embassy in Kenya, Maxime Deschamps, the digital manager at Wallimage, Belgium, Saul Williams, an independent filmmaker from the United States, and Jim Shamoon, executive producer at Blue Sky Films, Kenya. Tell me, how do you um, interact with that funding process for a film to be made? You know, the, the thing with making a film, today especially, is that if you're going to make a film that is going to be of a larger nature, that you're trying to get international acclaim for, then the money required is so huge that the only way you can actually get that money is to have a world-renowned director or a world-renowned actor who is agreeing to do this for you. Then as soon as you have that, then of course, you know, the major studios will decide, you know what, that movie will probably be a good seller. I actually know somebody in Nairobi who, if you go to them and say, I need $3 million, they will look at you and say, who's the producer, who's the director, who's the actress? And they'll say, okay, we can get half a million from France, we can get half a million from Japan, we can get a million from China, etc. But for us guys and the films that we want to make for our countries, what we cannot, we cannot raise that money these days unless either broadcasters are giving it to us or we, we have people like my friend Rene here or the Germans or they're going to you know, sponsor you to a certain extent. My company actually made a film called The Captain of Nakara, for which we got 300,000 euros from the ACP fund. But even getting that money, you need a track record. If you are not known, you cannot get money. If you don't have a CV of some sort, a reputation that you can go and say, look, this is what I've done, this is how much money I've made, this is how many people I've employed in the past, here is my tax compliance certificate, you know, we know how to do our accounts, then they'll even start talking to you. But before that, it is very, very difficult. We can come back to it if once we've listened to everybody. That, that was daunting, but hopefully we'll, we'll <laughs> come up with some, some good solutions during this panel. Gene? Uh, hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, one precision. Uh, I've been working in the production, uh, TV production and film for many years now. I'm audiovisual attaché at the French Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm not funding, I, I'm not <laughs> authorized to take part in any pre-production, production or post-production uh, content. Uh, so my work has to do today with supporting some major events, festivals. We created a TV and film market in Nairobi, which is happening in March every year. Uh, something similar to the MIP TV or MIPCOM in order to also federate all the professionals once a year to uh, discover, connect and trade, which is our, the punchline uh, under the title Kalasha Market. So that's, yeah, that's mainly what I'm doing. Uh, I will totally share what Jim has said by giving the example of the movie uh, called Rafiki, which uh, for the first time there was a Kenyan film at the Cannes Film Festival in 2018. That was a something quite exceptional. Uh, you know that, unfortunately, the film has been banned in its country of origin because it has to do with a, a story of uh, homosexuality. But the, the producer, Stephen Markovitz, yeah, is a well-experienced producer from South Africa. He first uh, decided to adapt uh, a novel uh, called Jambula Tree. So he has been working with scriptwriters. The next step was to hire a well-known director. See what you said, Jim, and he, he has chosen Wanuri Kayu which is one of the major director, uh, Kenyan director, filmmaker. Right. And then uh, the cast also uh, had to be important. And then because he has the experience of going to Cannes, going to the Berlinale, going to all those major events, connecting with people, he has right. a reputation, he has built a reputation all along the years. And by sending the script to the people he knew, he has been able to set up a co-production with uh, Belgium, Switzerland and France. So he could take the, the film to those so, places. Yeah, but, 
but yeah, but he has built a, a, a confidence uh, relationship, you know, with uh, that. That has to do with that. I said it's very important. Right. How do you uh, interact with the funding process? I uh, I work for a film fund in Wallonia. Uh, it's called Wallimage. So we we make we give money for doing films uh, on economics uh, criteria. So we we in fact. Uh, our way to work is to say, okay, we'll give you money, but uh, in exchange, you, sp you spend more money in our country. So this is another way to think the financing of a film because uh, you need money to get money. So it's kind, it looks weird, but, uh, but in fact, in work, it works. So, uh, so yes, my interaction with film is to try to understand how the uh, film will spend money uh, in our territory, in Wallonia, the French-speaking part of Belgium. Okay. And Sol? In terms of, of, of reputation, in terms of finding a way to, uh, to raise money, like, which is the question here today, um, one, I, I say start from the ground up. Um, I'm here now because I'm, I'm directing a film that we're shooting here in Rwanda with an entirely Rwandan and Burundian cast and crew. Um, and the fact is that I live in Hollywood and I asked no one in Hollywood for money because I knew what they would ask me, which is, well, who are you going to put in it? You know, we need an A-list star, like you said, we need an A-list director. I'm not an A-list director. Um, who do you have attached to it? And so, you know, so somehow we end up in the same conundrum of always seeing the same faces and the same sort of representation or lack thereof when we're forced to go through traditional routes of raising money. So what I did is I came here two years ago and I shot a sizzle reel. A sizzle reel is like shooting a trailer for a film before it's been made. And I took that trailer and I put it on YouTube and on a, on a, a, a what you call it, a site called Kickstarter. And with that site, I raised $200,000 to begin the process of raising money for this film. Now, how did you do that? I did that through engagement on social media. And that is how we can begin from the ground up is essentially like we all have access to YouTube, we all have access to Instagram, we all have phones, I mean cameras on our phones, we all can do something to build audience and essentially prove to people that what we're thinking of is possible. Because oftentimes when we sit in front of producers and are forced to prove ourselves, they're looking at a formula. They see a formula and they say, yes, this sort of formula works. And I'm, and I'm the sort of person who's saying, yeah, 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 but that formula is boring to me. Or they're going to insist that you create in a, in a way that may be different from your creative process. For example, when I go to a producer and say, I'm working on a film, their first question is, well, let me see the script. And my response is, who says I work that way? Who says I work script first? <laughs> right. You know, there's, there's, there's tons of ways to approach. You ask a painter or any other artist what is their approach to, to, you know, to their creative process. It may not be the way that the producer would demand of you. So you can conform to that process and learn how to appeal to, you know, someone who's sitting at the opposite side of that desk, um, which is necessary. And I don't mean to dismiss that as being, it's certainly necessary. Um, but there's also, you know, other ways to at least build enough leverage so that when you do enter that office, you can prove to them something that they may not already believe in. Like, you know, like we reference right. Rafiki, but, um, but Wanuri is, is, was you know, a renowned director before that film was made, right? Oh. And so she already had access before that script you know, was, was seeking funding. We have an artist who maybe doesn't have the network yet, but has an amazing idea um, and could be the next insert name here. Um, and they want to make their film, but all they have is their phone and maybe some friends. Um, and they know that they can do it if they get some money behind it. What would you say is the first step that they should take to trying to secure some money? Let's talk about television a bit because during the, 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 the Kigali Audiovisual Forum, we've been talking a lot about films, and I think that most of the people here, they are mainly interested by producing content, 
and not all this content will become real movies going to theater with the reality of having very few theater in East Africa. And, we can uh, say the first also, step to, to producing any yeah, uh, so, production. So one of the, one of the main uh, sector that, of course, you have to target, is, to target is television. Television definitely are people who need content 24 hours a day. They feed their programming grid with content. So the way we work in France is that when you have a project, a documentary, a feature film, an animation series, you first have to, to build the project, going to finalize a script, a synopsis, or whatever you call it. When that is done, you need to work on a budget. This is a, an important element. How much is going to cost to produce the, this type of content, which will be the duration, uh, what would be the, the format, uh, etc. all the technical details around it. Having done that, you need to build a financing plan. That's a document that people will ask you to show how you want to finance your film. So you have to start thinking of where the money will come from. And of course, there will be a line in your financing plan because it's not only one uh, potential partner who's going to finance 100% of your film. It's going to be various sources that will contribute to one day having the whole of your budget secure. And for that, you, it will take time because you will have to approach many people. Well, Image is one of them. Uh, you may have some various deals with broadcasting houses. But first of all, target the broadcasting houses. They are there are definitely people who need content. So right. with those three elements in your hands, you go to see the broadcasting houses. They might be interested or they might not be interested. But you have Canal Plus, you have the pay TV platform, like uh, Multi-Choice DSTV, Canal Plus. Those people, they have within their organization, they have commissioners, as they call them. Those right. people, their work is to aggregate, to find content everywhere. When you think of a budget and how to make a film, a lot of filmmakers, if they're making one, they know what they need to make their film. They know they need the places, the sets, the uh, cameramen, the technical aspects, etc., etc. What is something that you think that um, filmmakers sometimes overlook when making their budgets? Maybe Maxime can help with this one. Well, the budget, maybe, you know, we are an economic fund, so we... In fact, the, the, the problem for us and for Wallimage, we work uh, especially on uh, feature films and big films. We don't work on short film, and uh, we, are not the, we are not the first step uh, film commission. Um, we are better to, to, to engage money in big films, so it's kind of paradoxical because uh, this is not about, you know, maybe I'm a bit... Um, naive and it's paradoxical for a guy for an, an economic fund but I think that's the first step for us and this is how it works in, in Belgium it's to make short short film and to make a film with your friends without money and to try to be creative with nothing and but try to show people how you can deal with it so you don't especially need a lot of money you have you you just need friends and uh, yes a small plan and trying to study it after. But I think that the first step is to make content before uh, trying to be uh, effective. Right. That does echo something that was said um, yesterday on one of the panels by uh, the gentleman from Canal Plus, basically making these short films, doing what you can, putting them out and, and getting um, your face seen. That was also something that was said by Jim yesterday uh, when he compared um, filmmaking to uh, other entrepreneurs like uh, someone grilling corn on the road. He said that they don't ask for money to buy their charcoal, they just do it. Yeah. and then they sell their corn. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair comparison? Uh, I guess it's a, a fair comparison. I would say this though, you know, like perhaps the idea of making a short may not be, you know, so seductive to a new filmmaker, but you know, a music video is also a short, yes. right? And a music video is going to find an audience. And it's a great way to gain views and to, when you walk into that room, to be able to, uh, to prove, like, look, people are interested in what I'm doing. And there's no rules in music videos. There's no rules. So you c it can be a short. It can be like a film. And you can actually, you know, prove what you're capable of doing. Um, 
And, and you can also go through the process of learning what you need and what you don't need. Because what I find oftentimes, um, you know, it, it really depends. Like you may connect with a producer who tells you, well, you're gonna need this, you're gonna need this, you're gonna need this, and you're gonna need this. And if you don't know any better, you may agree. But with a little bit of, you know, with a little bit of practice, you may learn like, actually, I don't need that. Because, you know, I'm, I'm actually great at like setting lights myself, or I found a way that I can light this thing without depending on a gaffer. Or I found a way that, you know, like there's, there may be ways that you can cut costs as well. So I think that there are some things that people, that creatives overlook, um, but then I think there are also ways that producers overstep. And so we have to be mindful of the two. Um, I, you know, the thing that, that concerns me with the question of like when we're, what, you know, what we bring to that meeting, I think for many of us on the ground, the first question is, how do I get that meeting? How do I set up that meeting? Do I have to have representation to get that meeting? Now, I know this is about financing. It's not about how to find representation, you know? But if you're really starting from the ground, you have to first figure out how to, get your, how to get your work in front of that TV broadcasting company. And also, you know, there's a big difference between how films and, and television is produced in Europe, for example, and how things will be done here and how things are even done where I'm from in the United States. Um, because in the United States, we don't get help from the state to make our, you know, to make our films the same way that people in France and Belgium do, you know, we don't, we don't have, we don't have, uh, what is it, the CNC or whatever that is that you go to in France. It's called the CNC. Yes. Yeah, the CNC. Yes, yeah, yeah. you know. So there, if you, if you're making a film in France, even if it's a quote unquote independent film, you're getting help from the CNC. If you're making an independent film in the United States, you're making an independent film. <laughs> I think we'd like to know a, a bit about Slam. You said that was your first um, yeah. movie. That How did you get to the 400K? How did you get the meeting to uh, in the office? How did you take those steps? Now, I was not the director nor producer of Slam, okay? I was a creative that was approached. They asked me to write it. And I said, I'm not writing unless I get to act, because in fact, I'm in school for acting. I don't know anything about writing. I'm, I'm flattered that you like my writing, but I'm here to act. And so first, I, you know, fought my way to be on screen. <laughs> then uh, from there, uh, I know that Mark Levin was an established documentarian. Mark Levin is the director. Mark Levin was an established documentarian before he made his first feature. He had made already about 10 documentaries. So he was able to raise the money from sources that he already knew that had funded some of his documentary work. Right. Okay? Um, like I said, $400,000 is not a lot of money, and, you know, I don't advise this, but I also remember that now we shot Slam in nine days, which is unheard of for most films. We also shot it in a real prison with real prisoners, right? Um, and I know that he, I say it was shot for $400,000, but I know that he did not have the $400,000 when we started shooting. I know that because, <laughs> I know that because when it came time, for example, for the actors to check out of the hotel, we were told, uh, you guys can go ahead, we're gonna make sure you guys get home, but we're not gonna check out because we're waiting for the money to be on our card to be able to pay for the hotel. <laughs> you know, um, so it's a lot of huff, hustling. And, and, and yeah, sometimes it does take that hustling spirit. Um, so for artists like Mark Levin in the 90s or like Spike Lee in the 90s, I would say that crowdfunding still existed without the internet as we know it. Right. But they were crowdfunding by making phone calls, you know, going to organizations saying, well, this involves prison. Um, the, this the slam involved, uh, it was a young weed dealer um, who ends up in prison, and so they went to the founder of uh, High Times Magazine, right. which is a, a weed publication that was started by a guy who had served, well, who was sentenced to 17 years for uh, selling weed in the United States before he became a lawyer in prison and got his way out and started the magazine. So they went to him, and he gave money for the film. Right. So sometimes it's about finding people or organizations that are connected to the sort of topics that you'll be touching in the film. 
If your film deals with, you know, women who are going through blah, 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 and you see an organization that deals with women who are going through blah, 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 you may want to approach that organization and say, are you guys interested in right. investing in a in film, this film that, that could potentially on, yeah. tell your story? Um, I would like to get some uh, perspective on crowdfunding, uh, maybe from Jim and from Rene, um, you know, Rene, you were talking about um, getting the budget together and approaching um, people who can possibly uh, fund your project in, in some type of way. Um, but what about these filmmakers who have used crowdfunding to get all of the money that they need and now they just want you to help them to uh, finish up and distribute? Can I, can I wind this back to lower levels than that for, for a minute? Um, I think, I think with, with our countries, my country and Rwanda, I think most of the kids here are from Rwanda, right? And one of the problems that we have is that we live in poor countries. Our governments do not have huge amounts of money to put aside for cultural and you know, tourism related uh, funding. Now, what we have done in, in my country, in Kenya, is that, and, and I'm coming back to why this is not working, is that we have uh, universal funds, so all, all the telecoms pay a certain amount of money from their licensing fee that goes into a fund to promote culture. We also have a betting tax, part of which goes towards cultural and filmmaking activities. We have a storage device fund on the assumption that hard drives, flash drives, and such like, and memory cards can be used for pirating purposes. So there is a tax on that that is supposed to help the people who make music and films. And you know, we also have a youth fund. A part of that is also supposed to go for filming and music promotion. Now the reason that this doesn't work, and I have said this to people in my country a lot, and I'm saying it to you. The rule is very simple. You are either at the table or you are on the menu. So if you guys want to have some say in what you're going to do, you need to get organized, you need to form associations, you need to engage with government. Because tomorrow, if the president wakes up and says, okay, I'm giving you $20 million to make films, which bank account do you want me to put it in? You have no idea. You need to be able to go to him and say, this is our association that promotes filming, this is the committee that vets filming and such like to see which ones are, are good and which ones are not. This is the bank account that we have started to make sure that the funding is going to be disbursed. So that when the money actually arrives, you know, Rene can tomorrow source funds in France. And then suddenly everybody's like, no, I want it, I want it, I want it. No, you need to be ready for it when it comes your way. We have the issue like Rene talked about broadcasters. Yes, broadcasters all over Africa today are being forced to put in a compulsory component into their local content. In Kenya, it's 40% and not enforced. I don't know how much it is here. Because broadcasters go out, they don't get permits, licenses. When people see their minibuses there and OB vans, nobody harasses them. And they make their own content and they put it on their screens. And the filmmakers who have gone through school, studied, worked on the skills that they wanted to get are not being hired. So they need to be forced to outsource their production locally. That's what we have done in France. There is a, a certain percentage that obliged the broadcasting houses to invest with lo uh, independent produ production companies. Absolutely, because local advertising also will come from there. You talk, you know, there, there are people who represent telcos here. You know, you find that most of the telcos do their really big commercials either in other countries or they bring in foreign crews to shoot them. Again, you know, they should be forced to do advertising locally so that local companies can be hired to do this. The problem that we have in Africa is not the companies that are actually already running and making films because they generally have the experience, the CV, the record that they can actually approach overseas producers they can, they can approach, you know, funding agencies, and they also know how it works. You know, you go to Germany, there's, you know, a dozen different districts that have money for filming. 
and but they have the conditions attached to them. Yeah? So people like us know where to go and what to do. But younger producers, you know, they, they have no idea where to go with this. So for them to develop that first step, for that we need country assistance in our countries. And the only way we can do that is by getting the funding up and running, getting our film commissions and whatever agencies there are, you know, to get to hold them accountable, force them to to go and talk to government on your behalf. And that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I agree because with that this too. is this is a cultural thing. It helps tourism, and also you know we need to preserve the culture that we have in Africa. It's disappearing so fast, and the only way to preserve this actually is to do the films on these things, interview the old people, get the old stories done, get the fables in, make movies out of them and then we can carry on with that. Right. Yeah. I think those are some of the things that we are even trying to address here. This is just the second year of the Kigali Audiovisual Forum, but uh, you know, the country trying to promote that, that culture, um, coming up with the film office. You, you, you mentioned that uh, filmmakers and different people in the space should get together, form associations, uh, form the those unions. unions. Unions, in France we have unions, most of the producers are part of unions. Yes, in Belgium too, yeah. Right, uh, so when that happens, say there's a bunch of filmmakers and people in the space in this room and they say, you know what, we heard that panel. Let's get together and, and do something. What do you have to say to them? Okay, this is the first thing that you need to do. Well, as, as, as Jim uh, just said, I mean, they, they, there is a need. Uh, I mean, the governments in, in Africa need to show some concern. You know, they, Rwanda is a country that has really started a very important development. But uh, if the Kigali Audiovisual Forum has been set up, it's because the president has shown some concerns. Don't forget the audiovisual and cinematographic sectors in this major development that we are into. And that's very good because he, he has understood that from this uh, development of, uh, of the audiovisual and film sector, or more broadly from the CCI, the cultural and creative industry, there is a, a lot of employment to expect from that. There is a lot of income to expect from that. And there is a lot of promotion for, for the country. So that's something for sure. So now, now it has now to be the, the, the Rwandan government has now to show more, uh, and, and as Jim said, where could we create the equivalent of the CNC we have in France? The government has always been behind the professionals in order to put in place some favorable measures, uh, some uh, in order to create a, a, fun, a fund. Right. The CNC, through various levies and taxes, the CNC is collecting something like 800 million euros a year. Right. They just take 3% to cover their internal expenses because this is a private body. And the 97% of this amount is redistributed through grants to all the production companies. When you have a project, the moment you have, this is why I explained about the exclusive broadcasting rights, because the moment you have your project, as I said, script, budget, financing plan, the moment you have an agreement with a broadcaster, the second step will be knock at the door of the CNC. You see, my film is going to be broadcast. Look, I have the letter from the uh, any TV station. Uh, my film will be aired, will be broadcast. How much are you going to give me? And the CNC will make a calculation, depending if it's animation, feature, or whatever. And then it will, uh, there will be a grant that you can add to your financing plan. Right. And this is why we have something like 1,500 production, private production companies in France. They are not all millionaires, but they are making their living. Right. And by having so many companies, they offer employment to many, many young people. Because this is what you do when you start after your studies, when you have to learn by working a few months on a documentary, then on freelance basis, then another company will call you to work on a on a feature, and, uh, and this is how you will grow your skills, and one day you will be right, uh, so grown enough that, to that, say, that now that I'm, I, I could maybe start my own production company and become a producer, but it's right. a long process. And our Maxim, did you have something to add? To yes. You? Uh, you seemed like you, you, you were about to I say something. I wanted to yes, but I'm, I'm a polite guy, so... Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is, in fact, this is the reason why I'm here, which is because we are speaking about, you know, how, how does it work and how let's start, let's build an industry. This is the, yeah. this is the, 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 yeah. the subject. And um, in, uh, you know, Belgium is the same size as Rwanda and um, we have some lot of things in common. And 
20 years ago in Belgium, there is no industry. We were nothing, I, except, you know, people like Chantal Ackerman and, uh, or uh, the Frère Dardenne. Uh, we were, we were, there is no industry, nothing. And this is a political will to, to build an industry. They just said, okay, um, we have talents, but uh, we don't know how they, they, they produce with friends. So we still produce with friends, and we like to produce with friends, but we ought to make it to, to, to make uh, this film be in making this film in Belgium. So this is how we create a tax incentive, the tax shelter. This is, was the, the, the first incentive. The second was a cultural incentive, because we, uh, you know tax, culture, and the third was image. So you have taxes, incentive, cultural incentive and economic incentive. And this is how you can answer to all the, all the, you can bring all the solution and this is this whole solution together will make this industry works. And you know, well, Image is co-production, film office, let's helping people to find sets, to find um, uh, extras, uh, technicians, to get a film permit and also invest in enterprises, because if you don't have the good person to make the film and to make, you like, you know, post-production, if you can't make the, the post-production in your own country, it's impossible to, 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 to build an industry. Right. So this is well, an incentive for um, co-production in different ways and also for companies. It's very, very, very important. How do you think once these filmmakers have uh, gotten into the room, how can they make sure that they're not taken advantage of if they don't have um, the experience? They need to be engaging with government because at, at higher levels than that, a producer knows exactly to the last cent how much money he needs, what he wants to do with it. If you get hammered at that stage, you know, you're really not doing your job properly. I think that when you're doing a larger, larger budget film, you really, really need to have a line producer who is qualified, who knows what he needs to do. The, you know, the thing, the thing with the filming is that one of, one of the bad situations that we have in Africa is that we have a lot of colleges, we have film schools, we have, you know, I mean, in, in Kenya, I think they're churning out one and a half, two thousand students every year out of film schools. But they are essentially teaching their students what we call the director's department. They're teaching people who are going to be directors, DOPs, focus pullers, camera operators, assistant camera operators, and maybe sometimes DTI, which is the data wranglers. But other than that, when you look at a big film, there's like a thousand names that go by on the credits. The director's department is seldom more than 15 people, you know? But the other department for stunts, special effects, hair, makeup, you the, know, the transport, the catering, stuff. wardrobe, hair, you know, it's, it's so huge. And the options are, are there for, for a huge amount of people to be engaged in what will become eventually an industry. But unfortunately, we are like producers. I mean, I started, 25 years ago in film as a runner. And it was three years before I was even allowed to talk to a director because things were that, you know, that's how it worked. And what we have today is that we have a lot of students who come out of school and, you know, they say, we want to work with you. And we say, fine, can you come and work as a production assistant on this job that we have? And they say, no, 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 no. I'm, I've studied to be a director. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this, is, this is usually a really big problem for African students because you've studied hard, you've paid your dues, you've paid your fees, you've put in the hours, but nobody's going to hire you unless you can come up and say, I've worked on the following shoots in the following positions. A lot of the important jobs in film you grow into, you're not entitled to them by the education that you have. No, no good producer is going to do that. And what we do as producers, nobody teaches you in school. 
And, and when you start looking at some of the films that we are doing, when we did The Constant Gardener in Kenya, the budget for that was $10 million Kenya spend. If somebody is going to trust you with that amount of money, you need to have a record to show that you are transparent, you are accountable, you have integrity, and so on. To be in that room, you have to pay your dues. You have to be somebody who can be trusted. I was just telling somebody here that in my office is a sticker behind my chair, and it says that if you cannot be counted on, you cannot be counted in. And one, one of the reasons for this is because we also have a rule in production that if you are on time, then you are 20 minutes late. And again, we have this problem in third world countries. People just don't turn up on time. And if I hire you to do a job and if you're not there 10, 15 minutes earlier, I will never hire you again. Well, my people won't because they're even tougher than I am. But right. yeah, you really need to you know, work and get your experience. That's really the bottom line. I, I want to open the floor. Um, we don't have that much time left. So if anyone has a question that they wanted to ask, now is the time to raise your hand. I have one that's on the phone that we can start with as you gather your thoughts. But don't be shy. We're all friends here. It's cool. Yeah. So if you have your question, go ahead and raise your hand and someone will bring the mic to you. But let me start with the first question that's uh, come in on the phone. Uh, it's from, well, maybe I guess it's supposed to be anonymous. If Okay, I won't tell you who it's from. Um, and it says that the question goes to Saul. He wants to know what was the biggest challenge in his journey. I'm assuming that means in financing and funding a project. Uh, well, you know, uh I do think the biggest challenge, I mean, we face so many of them every day. Um, I think the biggest challenge in my journey has been particularly because I'm, you know, we in, as artists, as creatives, we often encounter gatekeepers, you know, who are determining the value of your work and whether your work belongs, you know, on, you know, in the machine whether it belongs on, on, on that network or whether it should be funded or what have you. And, and of course, you know, the thing about it is, especially when we start including government and what have you, I mean, I, in the US, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of work and great work that comes out of it, but a lot of it is propaganda. A lot of it is political propaganda. And if you have political views, and if you believe in the power of art beyond perhaps what a government would allow you to say or do, then you're really gonna face something. And so then you have to learn, uh, you know, how to um, anticipate the obstacles that you may face. Um, this of course brings me back to Rafiki, for example, you know, where, uh, you know, where this is a, a topic that worldwide many people are talking about. Um, yet on the other hand, you know, there are conservatives who don't believe that this sort of work, you know, talking about homosexuality or whatever, should be allowed to influence, you know, how people think and is that entertainment or is that the work of the devil or what have you. The, the biggest, right, the, the, the biggest, the biggest um, obstacle that I face oftentimes is, uh, is in trying to distinguish my work from the pop propaganda that many of the, uh, you know, the higher ups would have my work be. And if you don't fit within those systems or if you question those systems, then of course they have more and more questions for you. So I have had to align myself with, um, with very rebellious producers. And now some might argue that all producers are rebellious, and it's true that you know what producers do, they do not teach in school, you know. Um, but you have to find and surround yourself with a team that supports your vision and that is not trying to coerce your vision into something that you cannot stand behind, you know. And so I think that's the greatest obstacle that I've faced, um, essentially, is in in believing one. Uh, in the demographic that I want to reach, because oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll find people say, oh, well, you're educated, so you're trying to reach a very small educated few. And I'm like, no, this is for everyone. 
well, I don't believe that everyone is interested in this sort of thing. They're like, well, I know that everyone is interested in this sort of thing, so you have to prove it to that person. You have to find a way. So finding people that support and are excited about your vision has been probably the, uh, one of the biggest obstacles. So then I, let me take it to some of the people who would be funding uh, projects or know people who would. What is uh, something or what do you look for in the ideal project to invest in? If you, if you have script writers, if you uh, can conceive some, some stories, you, you cannot just unleash your creativity. You have also to take into account what are the tendencies at the moment. Talking about the broadcasters, they have some, they know, they, they know, they broadcast the content, they know who what they are wants. targeting. Some, we have some thematic channels today who are focusing on a special category of people. So they know exactly the type of content that make good audiences rates. And they know, and you have to take that into account when you come to them. Don't bring any type of project. Try to bring something that may seduce them, an idea that is definitely meeting with their expectations. Regarding. Right, but you have to also take into account that they think they know. Because, I mean, like when we talk about the CNC, yes, there's 1,500 independent, blah, 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 but we know but that the number of women, the number of people of color that have difficulty. Yeah, but the you CNC know, is not a broadcaster. No, I'm, I'm talking about the, the broadcasting yeah, but houses. Even, but, but the broadcasting even in, houses, they, yeah, they, you know, they normally they're supposed to know who they are targeting. You know, they, they leave from advertising uh, resources, and they know, uh, yeah, they know that they are more. Uh, focusing the kids, you have some thematic channel that are only for youth. You have uh, other major broadcasters that are targeting you know women, who women, women who are the, the, the you consumers. Know you know, to, all okay. those telenovelas were de definitely produced to target women at home, not working, you know, because they are the ones who go and shop and, <laughs> and use all the various products for cleaning homes. You know, the, you know that those telenovelas were mainly. Home. were mainly. Uh, uh, behind that, there were some bartering deals, you know, and who was behind Procter and Gamble, all those big guys, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, making the the powder for wash, the right. washing powder. So yeah, they, so they, so they, they, yeah, they know, they know the broadcaster, they know. So don't bring a, 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 a content. Try also to think; it will give you more chances that your uh, project, that your proposal, will be taken if you go in in the the right direction, you know. Uh, right, uh, Maxime. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not. Maybe you, I'm a big fan, so I work in, on big films, and I'm probably not the right person to answer to that, to be honest. But even, even, even though you're working on big films, there is a decision-making pro process, I'm assuming, yes, with who um, you're working with. We, in fact, this is a thing that I like in Wallimash. This is, we, don't, we, we don't want to stop creativity. Of, we don't think about creativity. We are just an economic fund, so we are just counting what will be spent in the, our territory, because it's uh, a way to, 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 to make this industry working. So, in fact, we are just like a, a comptable, an accountant. Yeah. We just, uh, our way to give money, we decide to give money if you spend money uh, in our territory. Right. That's not very fun, but it, it, this is how it works. <laughs> but, but maybe, Maxime, you will give more attention to, let's say, a comedy, because comedy is a genre that is working very well at the moment, so you will be probably more uh, yes, attracted more by attracted by, or if there is, you yeah. know, if, uh, if uh, there is a, a, an interest for the, for the region, uh, there is a bit of subjectivity, but most of the time it's objective, and we, have, uh, uh, we, we give points to uh, the, we have criter very Criter precise criteria. Criter yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we just give uh, some, uh, some, uh, some quotation, and this is how it works. Right. Not fun, but it works. <laughs> it's necessary. Um, so if there are no questions from the floor. Uh, I already asked a question, but also I need a, an advice from the, the man, the spoken <gasps> man producer. From uh, Seoul? Yeah. OK. okay. As a, a small a small starter in a film production like me, how can I survive in a industry in this society where there is no taxes from companies and broadcasters who, who 
who are looking for our finished products for nothing, but they say they are promoting us. <laughs> Okay. This is the, the question number one. You didn't get it. And uh, the question number two, what do you think about some broadcasters who are always saying, so we have uh, no right to pay to the artist because uh, we gain nothing. But always, from morning to night, they are using our finished product from our pocket. There is no help. How can we survive? Yeah, but well. I don't have a singular answer of, of what you have to do, although I have faced the same thing, and I've made individual choices at times, which is to say, well, then I'm not doing it, or then you can't share that anymore or you're gonna to have to give me this much if you're gonna share it anymore. But I do live in a country where there are regulations in place. So anytime they share something where my voice is, I know that I have rights. And I know that if those rights aren't respected then I'm gonna to have to go to an attorney and yes, that attorney costs money, right. but if that attorney believes in my case, then they know that I'm gonna get that money and they can take their payment out of that, you know, that fight that we know we're gonna win, blah, 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 blah. Um, it seems as though that's why these discussions are so important, it's important. to make sure that, you know, no, but, yeah, these, are, these changes can be made. But most importantly, it's important to stand up in rooms like these and ask those questions out loud and make sure that the people who are responsible for this sort of behavior realize the shame involved in this sort of behavior and realize the importance of art and culture and the importance of artists and of respecting artists and, that, and, that, and realizing that they need artists and that artists need to be sustained and valued. Right. But, yeah. No, just, uh, one word. If you want to move forward the audiovisual and film sector, yeah, you definitely do need to get a concern and support from the public bodies. They are the one that will put some laws in place, that will put some levies in and place. And to make sure that and the change is made. those laws and levies will benefit to create an ecosystem which will be favorable to developing uh, an industry. Absolutely. And, and, and giving a kind of insurance to all those young people that yes, they can engage in this, they can go, they can work in this sector, audiovisual sector, and they will make their living, day-to-day -day living about it, from, right. from, from it. But you have to create some, this ecosystem and that goes by yeah let, let's uh, right. uh, we've, yeah, we've yeah, come incen upon incentive tax to right. attract more uh, foreign shootings you know you had already two big shootings with uh, Petit Pays and, and Lady of the Nile you could have more but for that if you if it, and it's a good beginning is, is, that's is, for is sure putting an incentive tax like South Africa has done South Africa so far has been the only country in this region to put a tax rebate in place. That's why many shootings always go to South and Africa. And hopefully we, we will be just behind them. Yeah, Our time yeah. is actually going down. I think I'm going to have to wrap up. There yeah. is, now is when you guys come up with the questions <laughs> at the end of the thing. Um, let's just take, your question must be extremely brief. Uh, because we have come to the time, where is the person with the mic? People are raising oh, their hands. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes. Um, hi, my name is Zena. So yesterday on a panel, uh, someone mentioned that he, sorry, someone mentioned that a content should be unique. So they would rather take a content that hasn't been yet published anywhere. And nowadays, uh, we make, okay, YouTubers make content and put it on YouTube and they get a lot of viewers and then sometimes TV station take it. So yesterday on a panel, uh, someone mentioned that they would not want to take a content that is already out there. So they would rather have something that is already unique. And sometimes people produce something and take it to TV stations or any broadcasting channel and get a no. So they have no other choice uh, but to put it on YouTube. And sometimes pro broadcasters see it on YouTube and would want to put it on uh, their channel. I want to ask that question to Saul. And what are your thoughts about that? Well, yeah, of course, on one hand, you do have to be protective of your work and determine when is the proper time to, to, to share it with the public um, because of what that means then in, in 
the private forum. You know, once it becomes public, it's true. Once it becomes public in that sense, um, it's then hard to monetize it privately. Um, however, you can, you know, if you are deciding that, okay, well, I'm going to put this out there so that my next project can be sold, you know, before it's made, then yes, then it can work like that. But if let's say that you've spent, you know, your, your savings or what have you and, and a year of your time putting together a, a feature or something and you've tried to knock on doors and, 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 and no one's responding and, and, and there's no money that coming to it and at the end of the day you want people to see it, right? And so then you go, okay, well, I want people to see it. That was my actual goal. So I'm going to put it on YouTube. And let's say you do that. Um, maybe the thing to do then is to, because it's true, once you do that, I don't know who's going to step in and say, oh, I'm going to, I'd like to pay you to be able to broadcast that elsewhere. Um, so then maybe it's a matter of preparing what your next project is going to be and using that project as leverage for the next. That's one way that I suggest. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that, that, is, that is something that's extremely important um, as well, which is protecting your work and determining at what point you're, you're willing to share or compromise in the sharing process, you know? Um, and it's a hard decision to make. It's a very hard decision to make. Um, if it's encouraging to anyone, I've seen content go up online and then taken down because someone bought it to... It happens. To, to air it. Um, totally I, happens. That's all the time that we have for this. I, I, I would just la like one last final word from each panelist um, in consideration of the theme, which is, of course, uh, funding for, for production. So the last, uh, the last word from each uh, panelist. Jim, maybe we should start with you again. Um, yeah. It's a tough industry, but... It has lots of potential. Don't give up. Start producing, even if it's small stuff, even if you have to show it to the neighbors only, or yes. wherever you live in your neighborhood, you can put it on your screen. Start getting your viewership together. Build your name, build your reputation. It's an industry that can make you rich, but it's not going to happen in one day. Uh, uh, I would like to share with you an information uh, for those among you who are interested by the animation and game design sector, there is a, a major project that I've been working on, which is now uh, going to be a reality. We start a project called Createch Animation and Game Lab in Nairobi, Kenya, in January 2020. Uh, this is a curriculum which is based on a partnership between Rubica, Rubica is uh, number one, ranking number one in Europe among the best school of, for animation and game design. And they are partnering with a private school in Nairobi called Africa Digital Media Institute. Uh, Wilfred Kumi, the founder of this school, is here. Uh, Wilfred, if you can stand up for people. I left. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Anyway, he is at that table over there. Uh, for those who are interested, the, this. Uh, uh, we are going to offer through this curriculum two different courses, a 2D animation courses and a game design courses. And I think it's very good because I do believe that this sector are very promising for East Africa. The moment there will be some African content in animation and video games, it's going really to be a big, a big hit because especially the mobile operators are waiting for that uh, and they, are, they know that they will make a lot of money from that. So, for those who want to, to get the proper skills, because you don't start producing animation just by like that, you need to get, first of all, you get, need to get the skills and show that uh, you have creativity. So this curriculum uh, is going to start in January in Nairobi. For those who might be interested, start to talk with Wilfred over there. Thank you. I want to keep my last word to, to uh, address to the RDB. And uh, I see Felix just in front of me. And, you know, we spoke about the film funds uh, and the incentive. And uh, I know they, are know they know very well what they have to do to build this industry. So I hope I will come in next year and it will be done. <laughs> <laughs>
the direct response from our <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the, the final word? Uh, the, my final word is, is simply that, you know, one, guerrilla filmmaking, uh, you know, find, find a way to, to take that first step. You know, uh, I heard a panelist say yesterday that that famous quote of success is where opportunity meets preparation. Um, if you, you know, I was talking to someone earlier who wants to get their work published, for example, you know, and is had, having a hard time finding a publisher, continue writing, continue writing, start, keep on creating your content and, and working towards that thing that you want to eventually be able to monetize. Um, take, take every small possible step that you can to make it happen. Um, it's true if you have to go to you know, aunties and uncles and whomever and, and you know, neighbors to, to get the small financing at first, to finance just a part of that vision, to get it out there, to gain viewership or what have you. Take whatever small steps or whatever power and control you can have within the capacity of what's in front of you Use that first, you know? And then the other thing I'd say is that, you know, uh, prepare for those meetings because when you have those meetings, you need to find a way to impress that person that, that you're encountering who perhaps can open that door for you. Um, as a performer, I often think of those meetings also as performance. And I prepare for them the same way I prepare for the stage. And, and then the final thing I'd say is, you know, Find the artists and creatives and producers that inspire you. Find the stories that you can gain inspiration from because it's so easy to become disillusioned and to give up. And in fact, I've seen that success mainly comes to those who are persistent. Right. Right? And so just find the inspiration that can keep you persistent and keeping on trying to do it again and again, even if you fail sometimes, even if that door shuts in your face, even if that person doesn't want to take a meeting with you, even if you can't find the funding, keep on trying to find a way to say, no, nah, I'm going to get this done, and believing in, in the pro not only in the project, but in the process. That was our discussion on how to fund film and TV projects during this year's second annual Kigali Audiovisual Forum. My name is Makeda Mahadio. Thanks so much for watching.